Good day. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Creation Talk. My name is Joe, and this is Keaton Halley. Keaton Halley, and today we'll be discussing something interesting. So we're going to discuss Dr. John Walton. And Dr. John Walton is an Old Testament scholar who teaches in Wheaton College. And he has a very unique view about Genesis and the way we should interpret that. Mm. So first of all, before we start, um, we want to acknowledge that John Walton is regarded as um, a well-known ancient Near East expert. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and he has written this, this um, series of books known as the Lost World series. So you are the one who's really knowledgeable in this area. Can you explain to us what is ancient Near East literature yeah. and what is this Lost World series about? Okay. Well, the Near East, that's just, you know, the region like uh, where the Israelites lived and the surrounding areas, places like Mesopotamia and Egypt. And so there's a vast body of literature that's been uncovered, a lot of it even in relatively recent times. And so scholars make use of this material to help them understand what the worldview was of these different peoples that didn't all have the same ideas. They had um, various ideas about creation and religious concepts. And so what Walton has done, you know, the Lost World books started with the Lost World of Genesis 1, mm -hmm. and he tries to apply this ancient Near Eastern culture, cultural ways of thinking to interpreting Genesis, right? And says that we need to understand the ancient mindset. Uh, the reason it's lost, he says, is because we've changed our thinking over time and, and modern people and the, the culture that we swim in today think very differently than the ancients did. And so we need to sort of recover the understanding of these ancient peoples rather than read modern ideas back into scripture. Then we'll be understanding it rightly. He offers an interpretation of Genesis on that basis. Okay, so basically what he's saying is that we can't just read the Old Testament in Genesis as it says. We need to take this so-called foreign Sumerian engineer is mm -hmm worldview and use that as a way to interpret the scripture. Yeah. And when he does that, he comes up with some really strange or new interpretation mm -hmm. of Genesis. Yeah. And he would, of course, argue that he's just recovering the original idea that was there. But yeah, I do see this as problematic. And, and it's not that as kind of a um, broad brush, you know, criticism that we, we don't want to see it's completely illegitimate to use things back in that culture. Certainly when we're understanding the Bible, we need, do need to interpret it according to not just the rules of grammar that govern that piece of scripture, but also it does help to understand the historical context in many cases. And so you do have things like, for example, I think it's Genesis 15 where... Abraham? Yes, where God... Abraham has this vision when God makes a covenant with him and he um, sees that these animals... Well, he cuts up animals, right, and spreads them out, the pieces apart from one another, and then there's a fire pot that passes between the pieces... Well, from other ancient Near Eastern literature, we learn that this is a common thing to do in covenants. You cut up these animals, and it's a way of sort of invoking a, a curse on yourself if you don't keep all the terms Being of this, this bargain yeah. that you're making. Yeah, may this may this, the same thing that's been done to these animals be done to me. And so that's kind of what God is saying to Abraham, like, I'm taking this covenant seriously, right? So there are places like that where it's appropriate. But we think with Walton's claims in particular, when you examine the specifics— that's where his case really falls apart. Yes. So I think we have to make a distinction between understanding the culture at the time and using, in this case, the ancient Near East worldview to reinterpret mm -hmm. the scripture. Yeah. Because that's actually just a denial of sola scriptura, scripture alone. And I think one, one of the things about ancient Near East is that what, to use that as a framework to interpret the Bible, what we're doing is that we're taking, and by the way, ancient Near East is not one culture. It's mm. not one monolithic worldview. That's right. We're talking about the Sumerians, talking about even the ancient Egyptians and many different worldviews at that time. And they're trying to take all of that and let us know these are polytheistic worldviews. Mm -hmm. right? So it's contrary to the Bible. They are pagan. They are anti biblical We take that, impose that into, upon the Bible from a different culture, from a different location, a different ever from a different time yeah. period. Yeah, and certainly. we say you have to interpret the Bible through those lenses. Yeah, there were lots of differences, obviously, and in which Walton would acknowledge, you know, things like monotheism is a radical departure from all the surrounding cultures, right? Yes. But we should probably get into the specifics because I think the real problem with Walton's view, in, in my opinion, is that he his own ideas of what the ancient Near Eastern peoples believed, I think, is mistaken. So he's not really even in imposing ancient Near Eastern culture on the Bible, what he's doing is taking his, his, his misguided interpretation, interpretation of yes, um, right. ancient Near Eastern views and imposing that on the Bible. And conclusions that he comes up with are 
highly disputable. So what we mainly want to talk about here is his, his concept of functional creation. That's yes. it's at least how it's been labeled, how he interprets Genesis chapter 1. So what's functional creation? I mean, what's, what's unique about that view? Yeah, right. Well, he contrasts it with what he calls material creation. So material creation would be like if God is manipulating matter in any way when he creates. It's, it's not exclusively talking about the idea that God created matter out of nothing. That's one type of material creation. Mm. But another example would be if God creates Adam from the dust of the ground, that would be taking one material and transforming it into something different. And even that, uh, Walton would label that as material creation. And so his argument is that that is not what's happening in Genesis 1. God we tend to read it and think that God is making physical yeah, objects, yes, material yes. things. And Walton says, no, that's not how the ancients read Genesis. He says that these ancient Near Eastern peoples had a, what he calls a functional ontology. Mm -hmm. um, that word ontology, many people are not familiar with. It deals with what is it that exists, what things exist, and what does it mean to exist? And so Walton says that modern people have a materialist ontology, mean, meaning that what it means for something to exist is that it, is made out of matter, mm -hmm. right? Whereas he said, which is not true, actually. That's one problem. Um, we, we believe, you Christians believe in things like immaterial souls, yes. which are not made out of matter, and yet they exist. God's a spirit and so forth. But the ancients, he says, they had a functional ontology, meaning that what it meant for something to exist or to come into existence, to be created, is that it would be given a function. And he also clarifies what he means by function is not like a scientific function, you know, like, for example, um, for God to create the sun, he says, does not mean that he causes it to be a burning ball of gas, the way science would describe it today. But he says it is to have a role in human society. Mm -hmm. So how does, how does the sun get created? Well, it might have materially existed for millions of years. And yet what Genesis 1 is saying is when God made the sun, it means that God said, let the sun be a light bearer, right? Let it serve for signs and seasons that the stars are said to do that in Genesis 1. So he says it's Genesis 1 is just about God decreeing these functions for different aspects of nature, but that's not actually when they came into being in our modern way of thinking, right? So in this view, is God really assigning a function or is he just identifying maybe the purpose is the one of this? <laughs> Yeah, that's um, a further difficulty in understanding his view. And it's sometimes unclear even, you know, how to understand him. But let me give an analogy that um, Walton himself has given to help clarify this. He, he says, the difference here between functional and material creation is like a restaurant. When, when does a restaurant come into existence and say it's like a refurbished warehouse or something? The warehouse, the building may have existed for ages and then yet that's, the, the restaurant doesn't begin when the building was built and constructed and so forth. It really comes into being when it begins to operate as mm. a restaurant. Uh, but you apply that to Genesis 1, and when you ask him the question of like, so what was actually different between like before yes. God created and after, Walton says the only things that were really different were that after creation week now, human beings were people in God's image, were made in God's image, and that on the seventh day, God rested, which he interprets, this is a whole other aspect of his view, that um, he says God's resting there means he takes up residence in his temple, which is the whole creation is, in effect, his, his temple. Uh, we're not going to get into, into that aspect. It would take us too far afield. So what Walton is saying is all these things like plants, mountains, stars, human beings, they did materially exist before creation week, and then in creation week, God is merely really just giving people a tour of the restaurant, if you will, right? The restaurant could have even been operating, in a sense, prior to creation week, but it's like the opening day, and, and God gives people a tour and just shares about these functions that he's assigned. So really what he's saying is that Genesis is not even talking about the physical creation, yeah. so to speak. What about God, like you say, just giving a tour or giving um, identifying the function of different things, telling mm -hmm. us the function of different yeah. aspects of nature, so to speak? Is that what it is? That's right. And one clarifying thing as well. So people sometimes ask, does that mean Walton is denying that God created ex nihilo? And he says, no, the New Testament references are clear about that, that God did make the matter. But he says that is not what Genesis is talking about at all. It's not describing God making things. 
It's just about him assigning these functions. Okay, but at the same time, we know that John Walton writes for BioLogos. And BioLogos is an organization that promotes the teaching of evolution. Mm -hmm. They claim that God uses evolution, right? Yes. So in, in a sense, it still has to come down to an origin view of, I don't know, of evolution? Is that where, where he is coming from? Yeah, as far as motivations go, I mean, I, I, I personally think that's among his motivations. And you certainly see that Walton's views have been readily embraced by those theistic evolutionists, by those who want to marry the Bible with evolution. Because, they don't uh, have because to it's a way of saying, yeah, that if Genesis 1 has nothing to do with God making things, <laughs> Then Adam and Eve, you know, could have evolved and the whole creation could have evolved and there's no conflict between the Bible and science. But if Walton is wrong, <laughs> uh, and we have many arguments that indicate that he is, then uh, there is a massive conflict between evolution and the Bible. In fact, with John Walton, I think one of the biggest criticism, and I think this is a valid criticism that John Walton has not really successfully addressed, is this idea of a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. what, what do we mean by a false dichotomy and why is that an issue? Well, he treats these categories as though they're the only options and okay. that they exclude one another, right? So many people have asked Walton, why can't in Genesis 1, God be both creating material things and assigning functions at the same time? And Walton tries to shift the burden of proof onto people who'd ask that question. He says, I don't have to show that that material creation isn't happening. If you claim that material creation is happening, then you're the one with the burden of proof. Uh, <laughs> but I'd say he, he's the one making a claim as well. Yes, so right. he, yeah. he also needs to shoulder that, that burden if he's going to claim no material creation is involved. That's right. Because I think the traditional view affirms both functional yeah. as well as material creation. Yeah. And certainly we, we wouldn't deny that functions are a consideration of both the biblical writers and the ancient Near Eastern but there's much evidence that it goes beyond that and that Walton is mistaken when he says the ancients had a functional ontology rather than a material one. Okay, so here are some Old Testament scholars who are quite well known. I'll just read some quotations here. This is John Day, the so Old Testament scholar from Oxford. He is not a conservative creationist, so to speak, yeah. but addressing this ancient Near East view of Walton, he says this, However, although Walton is right to emphasize that there's a functional element in the narrative, he's certainly wrong to understand it wholly in such terms. And it's quite unnatural to deny that Genesis 1 gives us an account of the creation of the material universe. That is the only natural way of taking the text. So basically what he's saying is that this ancient Near East scholars is saying that you cannot say that Genesis text is denying the material universe mm -hmm. because Taking the text as is written plainly is talking about creation of the material world. Yeah, right. And there are many scholars who disagree with yes. Walton in this regard. Here's uh, Richard Averbeck, professor yes. of Old Testament at Trinity. He says, driving a wedge between material creation as over against giving order to the cosmos by assigning functions or roles is a false dichotomy yes. that cannot bear the weight of the text. And this does not stand up under scrutiny in ancient Near Eastern accounts either. The point is that material creation was of great concern in the ancient Near East as well as in ancient Israel. Yeah. Um, another example I came across um, in a book I read not long ago by uh, Richard J. Clifford, a professor of Old Testament at, at Boston College. Um, I just want to read a section of that book because it's fascinating. In this chapter where he's describing these creation accounts written in Akkadian, he mentions all these different verbs that are used to describe different creative acts of their polytheistic gods. Uh, but notice how many of these seem to refer to like manufacturing and craftsmanship. They have to do with making material things in contrast to what Walton says. There's the verb that means to make appear, uh, one that's to distribute or a lot, to design, uh, to give a name. There's another one. Many, many verbs, he says, come from the area of architecture and building, like to found, establish a foundation, to raise high a building, to repair ruined walls, buildings, and especially temples, to fashion, form, build, design, lay out. Mm -hmm. uh, a building or arable land, to create, plan, or uh, dust, or other things, uh, to establish solidly, to make, often of buildings, uh, to form, shape, of like walls, temples, heaven and earth, humans. And he says, by far, the most common verb is banu, to build, which is sometimes uh, alternates with this other one, epeshu or something. I don't know how, how to pronounce the Akkadian. <laughs> okay. uh, but he says it, it means not only to construct, but also to beget or generate. 
Mm. Um, different manual activity can be included under creation, like to dig a canal or cistern, to pinch off a fistful of clay, to tie together a raft, to heap up like a pile. And two verbs in their literal meaning, he says, imply sexual generation, like um, he says, to engender and to beget. And so there's no indication in, in all that that they merely thought of yeah. what it means to exist is to just have a function. It's coming to be materially. And, and these guys, these professors that we're quoting, they are well-established authorities in this area, yeah. and they're not even biblical creations. That's right. So it seems that this whole view that Genesis is just talking about function and not material creation, I'm sorry to say this, but it seems that Walton just made this up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not just this idea about Asian year is being functional, but let us look at the biblical text because mm. it seems to tell us something very different from what Walton is saying as well. Yeah, I think there too, we can show evidence that Walton is mistaken, that the biblical, not just the ancient Near East, but the biblical writers had this functional idea that they were working with, and that's all that they meant by That's creation. what Walton claims, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here we have Psalms 102 verse 25. Um, do yeah, do verse? you want to look that up real yep. quick maybe? Okay, I think this would be good. Of all you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hand. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe. They will all pass, eh, they will pass away. Yeah. So this is both verse 25 and 26. So notice it's the foundations of the earth, right? It's, and it's the work of God's hands. It's, yes. These are metaphors of like construction and craftsmanship. Again, in the, the psalmist re is reflecting on the creation account in Genesis and saying That's that right. God made all these things and he did so in this um, material, material way. Uh, one of the things Walton says, though, is like the, the verb mm. create that's used in Genesis bara. 1. It's yeah. bara, that's yeah. right. He talks about how, well, actually on page 96 of, I think it's the, his first book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, mm -hmm. he says the nature of bara is functional. Uh, but we see that as a problem, right? <laughs> yes, I don't think that's right. And um, I don't know, he seems to be taking this functional ontology view and reinterpreting every part of scripture that doesn't seem to quite match that. Yeah rather than looking to a text and trying to see what it actually says. And he, he literally like has a chart, which we've re reproduced in one of my articles, Critiquing Walton on our website, where he lists every direct object of the verb bara. And he says, you know, well, a lot of these don't seem to be referring to material objects. Mm -hmm. And the inference, therefore, he makes is, therefore, they must be functional. Yes. But again, these are not mutually exclusive or exhaustive categories. And so just because something is immaterial doesn't mean that, that it is a, a functional category. Like take, for, for example, God creates uh, north and south, mm -hmm. right? Those are not exactly like physical material things, at least. But why think that those are like functional? Like they're only defined by how they relate to humanity. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to, seems to me that they're just like locations that God <laughs> created, right. right? Or when God says he forms darkness and, and creates the light, he doesn't mean that like darkness is only present when it affects human beings, you know, like when we go to sleep or something like that. No, darkness is an actual like yes. circumstance that obtains when the lights go away. <laughs> yes, that's right. You yeah. know, so that's, it's not a functional thing. There are categories beyond Walton's things that he tries to set up as the alternatives, material versus functional. So even Eve, I mean, he, he attributes this thing about naming Eve mm -hmm. as if you're giving her function, right? That, yeah, that's one of his big things that, you know, there's a number of things that he talks about, just like the, the quote that I read from Clifford a, a bit ago. He, he does look at ancient Near Eastern texts and says what elements are embedded in their teaching about creation and origins and naming, he says, is real important. And we see this in the biblical account, too, that naming is often associated with when something came to be, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But strictly speaking, it's not true to say that something like comes into existence by being given a name. Because, I mean, was the woman existing before she was named? Yeah, the Bible, the Bible presents it that way. Yeah. yeah, so it's not true what Walton says that, you know, you don't exist at all until you're named. Yes, no, yeah. clearly they didn't understand it that way. And I, and I think it's just a, a natural association because we give infants names when they're first born, right? So it, a yes, name is like right. loosely associated with your origin, but it, tying those together too tightly, I, I think, is a mistake. I also see a few passages in the Old Testament that's very clear that's talking about a material creation. Mm, yeah. For example, in Genesis 2.20, the second half of the verse says this, but for Adam or the man, 
there was not found a helper fit for him. Mm -hmm. So that's not function. There's, there really isn't a counterpart. There isn't a female. That's right. So the, yeah, there was no woman at the time just before God created Eve. And we, it, Walton's, Walton's written a whole book about Adam and Eve, right? And so he has to explain away these accounts of the, the formation of Adam and Eve. He, he does a, acknowledge that he believes that there was a literal historical pair, mm -hmm. but he thinks they evolved from, you know, hominid ancestors. But, but how does he understand then this idea of Adam came from dust, Eve came from Adam's rib? He can't Function. interpret that literally because then that would mean it's a material creation, right? Yes, that's right. So his answer is that, well, if you look at the way the Bible uses this thing about human beings being, being made from dust, it says that in multiple places, not only of Adam, but of all humanity. And he says that merely means that we are mortal. That's all it's getting at. Not that we're literally, you know, coming from the ground, but that um, we're mortal. And so he says, well, why can't we see that that's what's going on in Genesis as well, that Adam is mortal. That's all it means for him to be made from dust. And so he can be made from dust in that sense, but also have been born from a woman. <laughs> so he really believes that Adam was made mortal. He could die even without sin. Yeah, that's true as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we should say, you know, what, what's the problem with Walton's interpretation there of, of importing that back into Genesis, that Adam was merely mortal? And e in Eve's case, he says, well, Eve came from Adam's rib. You don't take that literally either. He says Adam was, you know, fell into a deep sleep, which the, the text says. But then Walton says this all takes place in a dream that Adam has, that he's, he's literally cut in two and his entire side, rather than an individual rib, his, his side is used to, to make Eve. Mm -hmm. um, some of the problems with that interpretation are that it, it says one of his sides in the pool. So it talks about it has to be a rib, it can be one yes, of his sides. Yeah. And I mean, Adam would say he has two sides, and so God is taking one of his sides. But my main critique of that is that later on, yes, it says that God closed up the place with flesh. Yes. Now, if you have half of your body removed, <laughs> what sense does it make to say God closed up the place? With flesh. No, this is clearly an incision that God makes in Adam's rib cage. So yeah, that, that word itself can be translated as rib or side depending on context, but the context there in Genesis clearly indicates that it's a rib that um, God draws from Adam. But then the, the dust of the ground thing too, well, what you said earlier is that there it's not talking about Adam's mortality. God's not yet punished the man and said he's going to return to dust. This in context, there is no man. And then the solution to that dilemma is that God creates a man. It doesn't make sense to say there's, there's the absence of a man, therefore Adam is mortal. How's that a solution? It doesn't make any sense in context. So again, this is a false dichotomy that Walton has that he's trying to say, if it means Adam is mortal, then it has nothing to do with his actual material creation. No, it's both. Yeah, I think this false dichotomy is so important because if this criticism is true, his entire work you know, it's just reduced to nothing. The whole, yeah. the whole interpretation collapses, yeah. Yeah, and, th and this thing that we affirmed earlier on, we, um, John Walton um, believes in evolution. And so he believed, like, like we say, that Adam was created mortal, that, that Adam's sin and death existed before the fall even, so to speak. Yes, N not Adam's sin and death. I think what you mean is uh, that hum human beings human were beings. around. Yes, that's right. He explicitly says this too. In fact, he's uh, sort of changed his thinking on this over time. And mm -hmm. I think it was in the original book, Lost World of Genesis 1, he said, that Adam's sin did introduce uh, sin into the world. But now in later books, he's affirmed that there was lit personal evil. Um, that's on page 154 of his Adam and Eve book. There was personal evil before the fall. And, mm -hmm. and why does he believe that? <laughs> yeah, because there's an evolution and yeah. the idea that death existed long before Adam was created. Yeah, and you look in the fossil record and you see these human skeletons and they've clearly been attacking one another with weapons and so forth, right? We see like, their skulls been cracked by, you know, hatchets yes. and things. And so that's why he says, not, not drawing this from exegesis, not from the biblical text, but based on his view that geological evolution, biological evolution, these are facts we need to reconcile with the Bible. Therefore, you can't deny personal evil prior to Adam and Eve. So he's saying that we cannot use a modernist view and try to read that into the Bible, but that's what he, he does, you know. <laughs> that's exactly, It's not yeah. even consistent with his own yeah. methodology. Yep. And this idea that the Adam was mortal before the fall, that puts him outside of historical orthodoxy. I, of course, as, as uh, evangelicals, we are based, we believe in the word of God, but church history has presented to us um, some very useful church councils as well. So for example, the Canons of the Council of Orange, 529, 
It says this in Canon 1, if anyone denies that it is a whole man, that is both body and soul that was changed for the worse through the offense of Adam's sin, but believe that the freedom of the soul remain unimpaired and that only the body is subject to corruption, he is deceived by the error of Pelagius and contradicts the scripture. I could go on. Um, the Canons of the Council of Carthage 418 says this, Canon 1, if any man says that Adam, the first man, was created mortal, so that whether he sinned or not, he would have died, not as the wages of sin, but through the necessity of nature, let him be anathema. See, so this is directly dealing with views like water and say, if you believe that, you're anathema according to the Council of Carthage. And so we also- Outside of orthodoxy, mm, so to speak. Yeah. And we also, of course, often talk about how, you know, th this can have impact on your view of the gospel itself. Though. Exactly. The, the gospel is properly understood in light of the fall, in light of Adam and Eve's sin, and that being what brought sin and death into the world. First Corinthians 15 talks about how we all uh, die because we are in Adam, Adam right? And, right? And then it contrasts Romans that with five. being in Christ through faith in him and his work on the, on the cross and his, his resurrection. So thank you, Keaton. I think that we have looked at John Walton in a number of angles. There's a lot more we could cover, but basically I think Walton is interesting. He tried to deny that Genesis is speaking about a physical creation, but rather just functional. But in the end, he appeals to evolution. So he's not consistent with his own worldview. Do you have anything you want to sum up? Um, um, well, let's just point people to, if they want more on these subjects, we have written a number of critiques of Walton's books on our website. So they can just search for those on creation.com. We'll also link a number of uh, the key articles in our show notes below. And then uh, feel free to interact with us in the comments. We, we'd love to hear what you have to say. And Joel and I will be participating in the, in the discussion there as well. Mm -hmm.